Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I hope you I hope you enjoyed your meal. I'm Keith St. Clair. I teach political science here at Grand Rapids Communi Community College, and I uh, am, it's a pleasure uh, to have you all here. Uh, I again want to uh, thank uh, Pearson Publishing for um, providing the open bar, and Cengage for the hors d'oeuvres, and again my thanks to the uh, Culinary Arts Program here at Grand Rapids Community College for providing uh, a very, very good meal. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. And thank you all for attending what I think so far has been a, a very good conference. And uh, tomorrow, I, wanna, I hope that uh, many of you will be back. Uh, we have for a luncheon speaker tomorrow, Bill Ballinger, and uh, another great meal, and uh, some great panels scheduled. And in the morning, um, we will have donuts and coffee available in ATC 118, which is the room basically behind this wall. So uh, do come uh, at 8.30 uh, for the donuts and coffee, and we'll st get started with the panelists at 9. And also, I want to draw your attention to the back page of the, uh, uh, the program. I, I don't want to, we have a session, we have panel sessions after the lunch, and so I don't want uh, people to think that uh, if they didn't turn over to the back page to know that we have, uh, we do have panels scheduled for after the lunch. So uh, please don't, uh, don't leave without attending those. So uh, it is my pleasure to get to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, who I'm sure you all know quite well, uh, Lieutenant Governor John Cherry. Um, with more than 20 years of service in the Michigan legislature as a state representative, a state senator, and minority leader, Cherry has received many awards and honors, including recognition from the Detroit News as one of Michigan's most effective legislators. Cherry was named in uh, the 2005 Conservationist of the Year by the Michigan United Conservation Clubs and uh, is the m immediate past chair of the Great Lakes Commission. He has also uh, served as chair of the National Lieutenant Governors Association. Uh, he is most proud of his work in higher education and economic growth, making a series of recommendations that have brought higher education into the larger discussion of creating and retaining jobs here in Michigan. He also serves as a gubernatorial appointee to the Midwest Higher Education Compact. Uh, his interest uh, began as a teenager through organizing uh, and political activism. He took a job as an administrative assistant to former state senator Gary Corbin, later serving as a political director for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. That is until his election to the Michigan House of Representatives. As a legislator, Cherry ch focused on issues uh, that were most important to him, such as um, the environment and Michigan's great outdoors. He has authored and co-sponsored several milestone Michigan laws dealing with workers' rights, environmental protection, and conservation. Cherry received a bachelor's degree in political science from the uh, University of Michigan in 1973 and a master's degree in public administration from the University of Michigan, Flint, in 1984. He has been awarded an honorary doctor of law degree from Saginaw Valley State University and an honorary doctor of public service degree from Central Michigan University. Uh, he's married to Pamela M. Ferris. They have a married daughter, Megan, a son, John Daniel, and one grandchild. Uh, the family has an active interest in Springer Spaniels, which is uh, a soft spot for me. I have a, a standard poodle, so I'm a dog lover myself. Uh, and he's an active member of the Eastern Michigan Springer Spaniel Association. Uh, he's also an avid out hunter and outdoorsman, and uh, he lives with his family in Genesee County. So uh, please help me in welcoming our, uh, our speaker, Lieutenant Governor John Cherry. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it's a Real pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Now, I, even this evening, but uh, almost everywhere I go, with the election less than two weeks away, I've had a lot of people approach me about what my future holds and what the governor's future holds and how, and how we see our administration's accomplishments over the past eight years. And I guess it's only natural as we enter into the last two months of our 
administration to have those questions. Now, I'm not sure what the, governor's, what the governor plans to do, and I can only guess on how long my wife's honey-do list is. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of uncertainty right now. However, I, I can speak at length on the past eight years and the foundation we built to prepare Michigan's economic transition into the 21st century. In 2003, when Governor Granite home and I took office, I think it's safe to say that Michigan lacked an economic vision. We had a sense that the auto industry was changing rapidly, and we had a sense that manufacturing was changing rapidly. But little did we know the depth of that change, let alone how Michigan was supposed to deal with it. A lot of people, including the previous administration, thought we could simply ignore all the change happening around us because it was simply, simply a temporary state of affairs. The good times would return. They always had. That's what Michigan's economy was all about. Severe ups and downs, but the prosperity of the auto industry always remained. But I should say as well, there were those here in Michigan who counseled differently. They argued that this change was fundamental and that it would proceed with a vengeance. And their vision was extraordinary. Their urgency is why back in 2003, we made some very important strategic decisions about Michigan's future. First, we decided to get serious about diversifying our state's economy. Now, you should know when I went to work for Gary Corbin, that was back in 1974 in the midst of a recession. And everybody then talked about economic diversification. And then elected in 1982 to the Michigan House in the midst of recession, everybody talked about economic diversification. But every time the good times returned, the clarion call for diversification disappeared. And then second, we decided to get serious about investing in our people and our resources. And third, we decided to reinvent state government. So we began to look ahead at the following industries. Alternative energy, solar power, wind power, energy derived from biomass and energy stored in advanced batteries. And today, Michigan is leading the way on all of those fronts. Life sciences, using the research strengths of Michigan's universities to create revolutionary advances in medical technologies. And today, Michigan is leading the way here as well because more public university R&D is done here in Michigan than any other place in the nation. Homeland Security, combined advanced manufacturing know-how with our alternative energy and life science sectors to create new generation security technologies to protect America. And today, Michigan is leading the way here as well. Water technology, using the power of water and Michigan's ability to move it and manage water uh, to help stressed communities find water right where they are at. Not importing Michigan water somewhere else, but to help those communities facing water shortages to find the water they need in the locale that they're located. And while we are just getting started on that front, we are well ahead of any other state in the nation. Our plan from day one was to create jobs by diversifying our economy. And here's just a few examples of what Governor Granholm and I accomplished during those eight years in that regard. Early in our administration, we targeted advanced battery, the advanced battery industry, 
as one we wanted right here in Michigan, the birthplace of the automobile. We created economic development tools, including the first in the nation battery tax credits to build an entire advanced battery industry right here in the state. In fact, in August of 2009, the U.S. Department of Energy announced the recipients of federal grants to support advanced battery and electric vehicle manufacturing and development. And because we had laid that economic foundation, Michigan won more grants than all other states combined, a total of $1.35 billion. Additionally, these projects are estimated to create 6,800 jobs in the next 18 months and up to 40,000 jobs by 2020. And as a result of these grants, along with state and local incentives, battery, battery manufacturing plants are sprouting up across Michigan, from Midland to Holland and Brownstown Township to Muskegon Township. And all of that activity has led General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler to invest their new generation automotive future right here in Michigan because we as a state are positioned as the global leader in advanced automotive technology. You know, the same story is playing out with Dow Chemical, General Electric, and an emerging alternative energy industry in Michigan. And we see it as well in a new blossoming life sciences sector building up around the University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and Wayne State University. You see some of it happening right here in Grand Rapids with Spectrum and the Michigan State Medical Campus. We also created the 21st Century Jobs Fund. That is, investing in these emerging industries, advanced manufacturing, life sciences, water technology, and alternative energy, providing capital to commercialize research and to move startups to a second stage growth. The 21st Century Jobs Fund is a $2 billion, 10-year initiative to diversify the state's economy and grow high-tech companies and jobs. And to date, it has assisted in the creation and retention of over 1,500 Michigan companies and more than 24,000 jobs. That's a huge investment in Michigan companies and in companies that want to move to Michigan. This program was designed to be the engine of long-term economic change in Michigan, and it is working. Then there's also the much ballyhooed film tax credits, which were signed into law by the governor in April of 2008. And after two years, we can report the program is a nationally acclaimed success. We are currently ranked as one of the top three states in America for shooting all types of media because of the refundable tax credit. Filming expenditures in Michigan have increased from $125 million in 2008 to an estimated $223.6 million in 2009. Michigan jobs for crew exceeded 7,000, with another 4,000 jobs for actors as both extras and day players. And the bulk of the crew jobs average $30 or more per hour. But what has quickly become apparent in all of this is that Michigan lags in workers with higher degrees and advanced training which qualify our citizens for these high-tech jobs. And that brings us to the second leg of our economic strategy. I don't think there is anything, personally, I don't think there's anything more important than investing in the next generation to be competitive in this new economy. And in June of 2004, I was honored to be asked by Governor Granholm to, to lead the Lieutenant Governor's Commission on 
Higher Education and Economic Growth, known as the Cherry Commission. The commission was charged with identifying how to double within 10 years the number of Michigan residents with degrees and post-secondary credentials. When the governor first asked me to lead the Cherry Commission, we could not have foreseen the global financial crisis that continues to unfold today. We could not have predicted that two of our largest supplier, uh, employers and dozens of their suppliers would be dealing with bankruptcy. But we did know then, as we know now, that our economy is in transition. And we knew then, as we know now, that our students can no longer walk from their high school graduation ceremony straight onto the floor of an assembly line. And we knew then, as we know now, that a college degree or professional certificate is no longer an option for every single student in Michigan. It's a necessity. And we knew then, as we know now, that the only way to keep our kids in Michigan and to prepare them for the jobs of the 21st century is to give them a clear path to a higher education. And as I talk about higher education and college graduation, I do so in broad terms, recognizing that meaningful credentials are not limited to degrees from a four-year college or university. It can be associate degrees, a certificate of specialty, or the completion of an apprenticeship. In December of 2004, after months of analysis and discussion with educators, experts, and university officials, our commission laid out 19 specific recommendations with the goal of doubling the number of college graduates in Michigan in 10 years. Among those recommendations were new approaches to ensure every student was prepared to take on the rigors of college and continued study and to succeed in the new economy. We recommended professional development for teachers to ensure that they could best prepare their students. We recommended new efforts to target adults who had started but never completed their college degree. We established a major statewide initiative, the No Worker Left Behind program, which targets adults to begin and complete their degrees, links adults who have basic skills with accelerated training programs, and fundamentally reshapes worker training in our state. And as of July 31st of this year, the No Worker Left Behind program has helped 139,710 workers receive the skills necessary to compete and succeed in today's global economy. We also recommended integrating entrepreneurial skills and ideas into the K-12 and post-secondary curriculum. We recommended new compacts like the Kalamazoo Compact for communities. We improved tracking for degree completion and collaborative efforts between high schools and post-secondary institutions. Each of these recommendations was grounded in the notion that we must realign our approach to higher education with the priorities and opportunities that exist in Michigan so that each and every student can count on being prepared for and finding a good paying job right here at home after graduation. And even more importantly, we recognize that Michigan's K-12 system must realign itself to its new mission, preparing students for that all-important post-secondary experience. And here is where the emphasis on outcomes gains life. It's not good enough that every child in Michigan have access to a free and public education grades K through 12. 
Today's K-12 system must assure that every graduate is prepared and ready for a post-secondary experience. Six years later, I remain equally, if not more, convinced of the urgency and the importance of each and every Cherry Commission recommendation. And quite frankly, I'm proud to be right here in Grand Rapids where I noticed that Grand Valley State University has doubled its graduates during this six year period. I also understand that in Grand, Ra in Grand Valley, that 90% of its graduates find jobs right here in the greater Grand Rapids area. That's remarkable, but it's a model that needs to be needs to be pursued throughout higher education in this state. I'm proud to report we've made progress on virtually every one of those recommendations. We've enacted a new rigorous curriculum for high school students that went, in fact, went into effect during the 2007-2008 school year. The curriculum emphasizes math and science, a knowledge base that is essential in our high-tech economy. And we, ex and we are excited as an administration to see that what impact this will have on the, on the 2011 graduating class. We also replaced the old MEAT test with the new college readiness assessments to ensure that our new curriculum is working and to ensure that students are learning what they need to be successful in college. And we're seeing results. Achievement in reading and math is up in every grade K through eight. ACT scores for juniors is rising. The dropout rate is declining. Enrollment in advanced placement courses is up 70%. And community college and university enrollment is skyrocketing. Two successes that I talked about earlier, No Worker Left Behind and the 21st Century Jobs Fund, were products of the Cherry Commission. Then there is the third leg of the, re, of the strategy, reinventing government. You know, state government today is kind of like one of those cars that you see on Woodward during the cruise. And just imagine seeing a 19... 59 Cadillac Eldorado uh, driving in that cruise. Now that car may have been a great, a great car at the time, especially if you think about those vintage fins that they had. But it doesn't have airbags, doesn't have cruise control, doesn't have anti-lock brakes. Well, that's the kind of government we're driving in Michigan today. We're behind the wheel of a state government with fins. Now, there are some tremendously hardworking people in state government. I'm the first to recognize that. But there's a lot of old thinking and inefficiency built into government institutions as well. We had 20 state agencies, and each had its own personnel, budget, communications and lobbying departments. Some were not even accountable to the people you elect. At the same time, we have technology at our fingertips that can help us maximize opportunities for integration, collaboration, and eliminate duplication. That's the kind of retooling and rethinking we need to do and everything is on the table. We need to standardize our governmental practices while remaining flexible enough to respond to the changing needs of our constituents. We need to maximize technology to increase efficiency, communications, and transparency. And we need to make a government attractive to the next generation of public servants who are drawn to vibrant workplaces that allow them to unleash their creativity. Since 2003, Governor Granholm and I have reduced the number of state departments from 20 to 15. We've eliminated over 300 bureaucratic advisory boards, councils, and commissions. 
We have consolidated functions including human resources, accounting, and internal audit, and leveraged technology to improve service. These critical steps, in conjunction with the significant budget cuts, have helped make our state government smaller, more nimble, and more service-focused, all the while reducing cost. Since this initiative started, we have taken several additional important steps forward, including the combining of four departments into two, the newly created Department of Natural Resources and Environment, and the Department of Technology, Management, and Budget are the direct result of our hard work. And it's worth noting that everything we've done now has simply set the stage for the next steps Michigan will have to take. Adjusted for inflation, state revenues today are at the level they were in 1965. Michigan is $9 billion below the spending limitation imposed by the Headley Amendment to the state constitution. Now, a number of ideologues would like you to think that the governor and I have done nothing to but add to Michigan's problems. That instead of creating good paying jobs, we've decided to add to the size of state government. And I'm here to tell you that that's just, just plain wrong. In 2001, when Governor Engler was Michigan's governor, we spent as a state $57.1 million dollars from the general fund on the Department of Agriculture, $57.1 million. And to give you a little context, in her last budget, the governor recommended $28.8 million for that same department, a 50% reduction over that eight-year period. In 2001, the Department of Natural Resources and Environment received $152.4 million, where today the DNRE received $42.1 million. That's a 75% reduction from the previous administration. From 2001 to 2008, we've reduced the size and number of state workers by more than 11,000. And we have been lauded. The governing magazine is one of the best managed states in the nation. And this is what Moody's said about Michigan in its latest reaffirmation of our bond rating. Michigan's ability to handle a severe and protracted economic downturn underscores the importance of its governance and financial management strength. In other words, we have taken the right steps to build a more efficient state government, and it's time to go even further. <laughs> I've told you about these three decisions we made to grow and diversify our economy, to invest in our people and run a smart, streamlined government. But the most important decision we made was embrace change instead of trying to fight it. It's not to say that Michigan has completed its journey into the future. To the contrary, our journey has just begun. But we have launched down a road intended to shape our future instead of being victimized by it. Politics is changing as well. When I was an undergraduate in 1970, the model of American political participation was pluralism, defined by a number of landmark behavioral studies. And while I do not believe that 2010 is a realignment election, there are political currents at work that are not explained by the old models, at least as I learned them and practiced them for the past 40 years. And I cannot help but note that every significant economic change in this nation's history has been followed by equally revolutionary political change. 
from our revolution, from independence from Great Britain to a civil war that was fought in 1860. And you can hear the rumblings of those tremors emanating from the political landscape in Michigan and across the country today. You see them every morning when you turn on the television. And after, just think about it in this context, after a session of historic activity, Congress today is viewed as inept. In public, op uh, public opinion polling, Democrats and Republicans are competing not over who does the public prefer, but rather who commands the public's disdain. The Detroit Free Press endorsed a Michigan Constitutional Convention. An editorial on October the 3rd calls for the people of Michigan to decide for themselves if the legislature and other elected officials in Lansing are truly acting in the public's best interest. And they rightly point out that this option of a constitutional convention won't be up again for another 16 years. And the question remains, is now the time to update a document that's 48 years old? How do we make sense of all of this? As I walk off this stage, it may be that your time has come. How do we realign political boundaries and adjust economies of scales to rescue cities and school districts whose tax bases no longer support public services required by their residents? How do we utilize our advancing communication technologies to enhance transparency and empower citizens to compete against organizations with huge financial resources for the attention and direction of our democratic institutions? As an undergraduate, I took as a given what Hobbes, what Hobbes and Locke offered as the foundation of government, that to escape, quote, the state of nature, we entered into a compact with authority. With all that's occurred over the past decade, it has come home to me and many of our citizens that this, quote, state of nature may be more than a philosophical construct. This election in 2010 is not an ideological statement. It's not a partisan statement. It's simply a declaration by the American public that authority has not lived up to its side of the agreement. So how do we reconstruct that foundational compact? As I walk off at of this stage, Eyes will turn in your direction. It will be more than the eyes of your students, and it will be more than the eyes of the public officials and political activists who seek answers to these questions. It will include the eyes of our democracy as it seeks to simply survive and meets the challenge of this new century. It's a Chinese curse of sorts, we live in interesting times. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we definitely have time for uh, Q&A. So, um, Roger, do you have a question? Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, is there any questions for the governor? Yes. Ha, 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 ha.
Well, you know, it's uh, sometimes easier said than done. Um, you know, the, the Senate is a, uh, as is the U.S. Senate. I, I don't know how many of you have ever read uh, Robert Carroll's uh, biography of Lyndon Johnson, the uh, master of the Senate. Well, the first, the first pages of that, that um, biography is probably the best history of the United States Senate I've ever seen. And it's terribly intriguing. But, you know, it's an institution. Even in Michigan, it has some, some real tradition of being the place where debates occur uh, because, in fact, you can debate. And, you know, and back when I was in college, one of the things that students, particularly at Michigan State, enjoyed to do, I was at U of M, but Michigan State, they loved to go down to the Senate chamber to watch Bob Huber and, um, and um, uh, Basil Brown debate over the, uh, the Vietnam War because they were two gentlemen who were extremely knowledgeable and could debate in a respectful way in which opinions differed, but they could put their, their, their point of view forward. You know, I hear a lot in politics today about candidates saying that I will reach over across the aisle. As soon as a candidate says that, I, <laughs> I get nervous, okay? Because there's nothing wrong with having an opinion different than your colleague. It comes down to, though, respecting the nature of debate and understanding that it is okay to agree to differ. If you have that kind of respect, you can actually achieve the compromises that are necessary for governing this state. And that is, that is really what we need. Um, you know, people say less partisanship. I don't think it's partisanship that's at work. We want people who have strong opinions and, and, and ideas they believe in. We want them to advocate for those. But we want them to do it in a respectful way. And I, I noted, I, was, I, I did a class down at U of M last week, and, I, and, we, and there was the, I had a series of, of articles uh, from the Detroit Free Press post-debate, you know, about four or five column, columnists who made the point that there was nothing elucidating in the debate. And I said, there wasn't. But you know what? If there was any candidate running for governor that told the truth, they wouldn't get elected. You know, I mean, that's the simple fact because the decisions are difficult and hard. And so what we need to really be doing as we assess legislative candidates running for the House or the Senate is are they prepared to be respectful to someone with a differing opinion? I'm not asking if they give up or that someone has to win the argument, but you have to be respectful because when there's respect, trust will follow, and when trust follows, it's possible to reach a compromise in which both parties achieve something, but the state advances. That's what the issue is. And, and what is sometimes lost today in, in both legislative chambers and in the Congress as well is the notion of respect and the ability to disagree uh, or agree to disagree. And, um, and everybody wants to get complete victory. That isn't going to be achieved, and that's why we're stymied at this point in time, I think. And so um, I, I've, I've, I've enjoyed my service in the Senate. I enjoy presiding over the Senate. To some extent, I'm disappointed today that some of the great traditions of de debate, debate and compromise aren't there as they have been in the past. Well, it certainly plays a role. Um, I would also suggest that um, another, f I mean, first of all, it does, because you have people who about the time they're learning to do their job are required to move on. Uh, and so that's not helpful. You, it, you know, it's before term limits, the average s length of service was 10 years. Um, so, it, you know, we haven't accomplished much in that respect. But we've, what we have is, what we have lost are individuals who had the respect of their constituents and their constituents wanted them to stay on the job and they had, a, they had some institutional knowledge that's not available now. That's important to any process. But equally important here is I believe our communications technology today is terribly alienating. Um, uh, I mean, people are able to converse without facing each other. Now, there's some advantages to that and some good things, but 
when I see two legislative leaders negotiating by text, I'm saying that makes no sense. You have to be face to face because it requires trust again, and you can't you can't read trust into a text message. So I mean, we our technology is seducing to some extent and alienating us, and it's not just with our leaders; it's with our voters as well. It's with the student. You know, it, it, it's an alien. It's by the fact that it brings us together to communicate. It alienates us from each other personally. And I think that plays a role, too, because if you're alienated from those you're working with, you can't, you can't work together. I mean, the one thing we know economically in the workplace, teamwork is what allows us to compete. And that's what businesses are, and I'm sure uh, as you conduct, you know, your, your academic business, one of the things you look at is trying to do it in a way that encourages teamwork. And, um, and that becomes missing and if you have alienation governing the process. So I think that's a factor as well. And then you've got this problem with this, uh, uh, this, this news cycle, you know. Nothing has a shelf life more than three days, you know, and then people, it's like we, we're all politically um, um, uh, hyperactive <laughs> and can't keep our attention. We've got, we got deficit attention politically that keeps us from focusing on how to deal with the problem that's in front of us. Well, thank you very much, I enjoyed it. Okay, Roger, you have.